All right. Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse number 17. Well, welcome everyone. I hope you've come tonight again to just uh, worship the Lord and uh, open the Word. I will say, uh, to, as we begin, there, it's so difficult uh, as we approach something like the Word of God to cover everything you know, that's wonderful about God's Word and about its usefulness to us. And it's certainly difficult for us to cover any new ground. But uh, I hope this will be an encouragement to you tonight that will stir you a little bit. Um, to some special desire for the Word of God and its usefulness. All right, let's grab our Bibles. Ephesians six seventeen. Last week, what did we speak about? Does anybody remember? The helmet of salvation. And this week, we're going to be talking about the sword of the Spirit. This is the last and final piece of God's whole armor that we are to take unto us. Let's begin here. It says this. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. God's Word is pictured here uniquely aside from all of the qualities of salvation in that it is the sole weapon that can be used for the offensive. It's unique in that it is one of only two of the items in our armor which we hold in our hands, the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit. The Christian in battling the devil would be without the Word of God just trying to survive. And I think it's an important acknowledgement. Without the Bible, the Christian is just trying to survive with his own righteousness and his salvation And all of the equipment you get from accepting Jesus Christ, if you do not wield the Word of God, you're just trying to make it out alive. And I think it's really important for believers when we have this great battle waging around us, this spiritual warfare, not the flesh and blood battle and wars that we see today, but the true spiritual warfare. The Scripture says, and again, we started Ephesians, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Our human swords, weapons, and machines, they're nothing in the spiritual realm. Satan does not fear America's tanks or F-16 fighters. He is not afraid of, uh, of our, the, the power and the might of our government and intelligence agencies. He does not fear the drones or nuclear warheads. The only open to the right page, I'll never find it because I've been doing this a long time and I've never seen it. Uh, so I'm just going to tell you it's possible to do that, but it's not, a great, it's not a great advice. 
Well, a few months later, the pastor met up with Frank again, and there he was, got his Rolex and his nice suit, and he's looking rich again. And he said, Frank, what happened? And Frank said, I did exactly what you told me. I went home, I closed my eyes, opened my Bible, I put my finger right there. And lo and behold, I saw the two wonderful words. Chapter 11. Okay, <laughs> that's the myth. <laughs> you know, bankruptcy, chapter 11. Okay, I think, I think it's important for Christians to acknowledge that the Word of God is a powerful weapon but we need to learn how to use it. What does God say about his word and how the Christian can wield it with great success? First of all, we acknowledge that words are powerful. And the Christian knows, or should know, possibly better than anyone, how powerful what we say is. If we were to go through the Old Testament, I could give you a number of proverbs and, and, and wise sayings that acknowledge the power of our words. Proverbs twelve eighteen says, There is that speaketh, like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. We know that words are powerful. Psalm 42.10, the psalmist says, As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me, while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? And he recognized, the psalmist recognized, the wise King Solomon and his Proverbs, they recognize the power of words, but this is not a study on the power of the words. It's a study on the power of the Word of God. The Christian is not only to be careful about what he says, but especially to use what God has said to approach the world. What a challenge it is, not only to use words, but to use God's words. Amit Ray says this, take care of your words, and the words will take care of you. <laughs> and that's true. And there are many messages on our speech and how we ought to be careful what we say. But this is about how the Christian uses the Word of God to do battle in the world, and especially in the Spirit in our lives. So, let's begin with what the Word of God is. First of all, the Word of God is a spiritual sword. It's a spiritual sword. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 10, 4. 2 Corinthians 10, 4. We're reminded again that as we talk about the power of God's Word, we talk about its spiritual qualities. And not only the, the ink on the page, and we've seen that. Remember, we told that famous story of George Foreman when he went to fight Muhammad Ali, and he brought his Bible, but he brought it with a lot of other good luck charms, and he thought, I got a Bible, I got good luck, I'm going to go into this fight, I'm going to win. But he said later on in his life, he realized it wasn't, the, it wasn't the book that he was holding, it was the words of God that were in the book that really began to change his life. And the Christian has got to acknowledge that the sword of the Spirit and the ability to use God's Word is to use them spiritually. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 10.4. For the weapons of our warfare are not, what, carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And so if we use God's Word spiritually, it has power. Now, as we um, take the time to acknowledge this, remember, you can't just use God word, God's Word any old way that you like. And, and that happens today. We can't just take the Word out of context and it re retains its power. We cannot quote the words or repeat the words, and it is powerful. We know this. God is not interested in vain repetitions. He's not interested in earthly um, ex exhibitions of the Word of God. And we, some people may, or in, in their faith, think that if they just keep saying the Bible over and over, that it will save them. And it's certainly, if they heed the words they're saying, it will. But it is the spiritual use. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So what are they? They're spiritual. They're spiritual. Turn with me to uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, just a little farther back. As we talk about the spirituality of the words, he says here, this is the sword of the Spirit. The Word of God becomes powerful when I, by the Spirit of God, begin to use it in a spiritual way for spiritual means, for spiritual ends. Verse number 6, who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament. That's the New Covenant. That's what we call the Matthew through Revelation in our Scripture, isn't it? But what does he say? 
not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. And I think it's important to acknowledge that when God gave us this Word of God, it was His intention that we would use it properly. I mean, you've heard stories about how, you know, and and even as a pastor, I've been tempted sometimes not to say the words to my children, right, but to to really hit them upside the head with the book, literally, right? (laughs) Maybe this will help, but it doesn't, does it? And you've heard stories about pastors with a Bible in their pocket, and they were shot, and it saved them, or something like that. And this is fine and good, but in Christianity, what we're talking about here, the power of the Word of God comes when we use it in a spiritual way. It is the sword of the what? The Spirit. Let's go back to that passage in Ephesians. There's not much here in the way of words, but I think that helps us because it helps us to see what's really and truly important. Sometimes when you have a lot of commands and a lot of talk about something, it's difficult to grasp all of the principles. But this is very simple. In Ephesians chapter number 6, he says what? He says that we're supposed to take excuse me, in verse number 17, the sword of the Spirit. And this is God's sword. I started to think about the sword of God. That is, this is, the, this is God's own sword. The one that He uses. God did not give us what He does not use. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So number one, it is a spiritual sword. Number two, it has two edges. It has two edges. Why are the edges of this sword important? Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12. You grab your Bibles. You know this. You could quote it to me, right? You could tell me what Hebrews 4, 12 says. Um, It says the Word of God. That's right. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And again, we'll remember we talked about it as a spiritual force. It says this. The Word of God is what? It is quick. That word quick does not mean fast. That's what it means in American language, right? But the word, the quick and the dead, right? The word quick means alive. The Word of God is alive and powerful. That's why you can't use it your way. You have to use it God's way. Because when you take hold of the Word of God, it has a mind of its own. And in all kinds of lore and fantasy literature throughout the years, we hear of special weapons that uh, give that that wield themselves and give man great power fairy tales and such and the reality is that there is a truly living and powerful weapon that when the christian takes hold of it it takes hold of them you might at once when taking hold of the word of god become as deadly against satan even as a novice as anyone ever was that was skillful in the word And though the skills of the Word are important, I just were reminded that the Word of God is sharp. And it's alive. And I like that because I'll be honest, me and Satan in a battle, who do you think is really going to win? I mean, maybe we think we're smart. You think you're a smart Christian. Satan's been around for at least 6,000 years. He's no joker. He's seen it all. He's seen every battle strategy known to man. He's seen warfare evolve. He has fought many a believer. He's fought and crossed swords with Christ himself, hasn't he? So Christians, we can't, aren't you glad the word of God is alive? That it has a power of its own? That it has its own deadly force? It is quick. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. And that's saying something. You know, again, the Roman culture, they were renowned. They were renowned for the sharpness of their sword, the gladios, that they took a short sword. The Romans, um, again, kind of different. You know, you might, when you think swords, and I think swords, generally I think in America we think kind of back to like the, uh, like the Middle Ages, you know, the medieval times with the large, broad swords, you know, the long, heavy, wielded things. The Roman gladios wasn't like that. It was a short sword. And... Uh, and they, and they used it in close combat, and it was designed you know, with two very sharp edges to pierce. And they were famous for the sword. It was, a, it was a new kind of warfare that they did in close combat, and it really made them extremely successful. It was adapted from the Spanish version, and it's not what you think. It was a short 
and sharp sword. So when he talks about sharper than any two-edged sword, that's saying something because the Romans prided themselves to have created the weapon of the century, right? In their sword. And no doubt every man that had ever been in this battle had seen that sword and revered it with some kind of sacredness. I was reading a story about um, the Japanese and uh, their loss in the World War. And one of the things they said was the Japanese so revered their weapons that they were, not, they were prone to not changing. And so while throughout the course of World War II, uh, you know, places like Germany and America and Britain were researching and were creating machine guns and various, and they were moving on. The Japanese just had their same old single-shot guns, and they almost wore it as a badge of honor and pride that they were using that weapon, right? And so they, they were left in the dust in that, in that regard, and it, and it became, it was part of their downfall was that they were so prideful about that singular weapon. And so you, you could already see how cultures, how a culture like Rome might attribute to that weapon all of their victory. And Paul says, look, you don't understand God's weapons. God's sword is sharper than any two-edged sword. And so such a lethal and revolutionary weapon of their time, Paul is saying, look, you haven't seen anything compared to what God has given us in respect to life and power. Piercing, and again, this was the, soul, this was the purpose here. Piercing and dividing asunder the soul and spirit of the joints and marrow is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the Word of God is compared to a sword, a sword with two edges. I like this. Um, John Gill said it this way. The sword has two great edges, the, the law and the gospel, right? The law that, 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 uh, that put, brings all men into guilt, that pierces them, that cuts, and then the gospel that touches the heart, right? And I just I thought, it's like, what a great, uh, these, some of these old guys, man, they had some good stuff. So we have a two-edged sword. And, and again, uh, that's not a new thing. It's kind of interesting to me. Over time, I've tried to wonder why the emphasis here on the two edges. You know, we talked about the shield of faith, for instance, um, the breastplate of righteousness, and how some of, the, some of the items in the Christian's armor from Ephesians 6 have kind of evolved throughout scriptures. They might, might be the shield of faith, or you might have the breastplate of faith, right, in love, or something like that. But the scripture, when it talks about the sword, it's been cons- it's consistent throughout. The two-edged sword was desirable. It even seems almost like it was rare the way they speak about it. Or it was revered for its sharpness, for its ability to pierce. And you're going to see throughout the scriptures, every time he mentions this sword of God, he's mentioning the two edges. Look at uh, Revelations 1.16. Turn there. You'll see if you turn to Revelation chapter 1, you'll be fruitful because you get to get two verses in two pages. So we'll get a start here. Revelation 1. It has two edges. And I like to think of it, again, in the scripture, the significance of the twos, right? Uh, we know the two witnesses, the law and the prophets, right? The, the, in, in the New Old Testament and the New, maybe there was a reference here to that. I'm not exactly sure, but I think it certainly is something to ponder. Revelations 1.16 says this, And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. By the way, we can instantly see how Revelation should be interpreted from this first chapter. Many times as we look at the various uh, pictures and types and apocalyptic kind of um, representations and revelations. We start by like, seeing all these wild things, right? There's considerations. Maybe the scorpion was a helicopter. And those of you that have read it, you know what I'm talking about. But we see right away the representations are very clear here. He had a sword coming out of his mouth. That makes it pretty difficult to talk, doesn't it? <laughs> but we know that the sword of the Spirit is the what? The Word of God. So we, we instantly look at this man, you know, with that, that holds the seven stars, right? And, and what are we talking about? Well, like probably the churches, right? The, whatever. The angels. We have the stars have a variety of representations. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. He has the feet of bronze and he has the white robes. And we, we see all these kind of things that we, throughout the revelation, and we can see these are representations of the truths about Christ, not visuals of his actual look. I mean, how many of you think it might be a little, a little difficult if Jesus had a sword sticking out of his mouth all the time? 
We wouldn't want to be getting too close to that guy. He might turn around too fast. I mean, you know, I'm just, the point I'm making is that we sometimes we take the representation of Revelation too far. It's important to acknowledge the precedent that's set by this, and we have it, and the sword helps us to do that. Out of his mouth goes a two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Revelations 2.12. Revelations 2.12. And the angel of the church of Pergamos write, these things says he which hath the sword with what? Two edges. So there seems to be some kind of emphasis on the two. And I think probably the old commentators had it right when they say the law and the gospel or the old and the new testament, right? Um, and then, uh, and that's not, again, that is not only a new testament. That's actually old testament reference. We talked about the armor of God being from the past. Let's look at Psalm 149. Psalm 149. The second to the last psalm um, in the Bible, verse number 6. And this is, this is a, again, it's a, really a psalm of praise and worship, talking about praise in the Lord all through this psalm. And it says in Psalm 149, 6, it says, Let the high praises of God be in their mouth, and the two-edged sword in their hand and so this is an old testament representation we saw that paul is taking a lot of these old testament truths and bringing them in to the new testament and then identifying them this sword has two edges why the edges i think we could say if we read hebrews chapter 4 it's clear to see for the piercing for cutting for dividing and discerning and and i was trying to think what as we try to wrap our minds around what God is saying, the words of God are designed to pierce mankind, to cut him to the heart. They're designed to, to discern in man between the soul and the spirit, to see his values, to who he really is, whether or not he's truly saved. Discerning the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Man, how many times has the pastor spoke about a sin, and you, like me, felt the flesh of, like, man, he is talking to me right now. Do I look as guilty as I feel? Has anybody ever had that in a service before? You know, I, I don't sit down or thank goodness very often, so I don't have to get that feeling. It's good for me. I, I wish I could have it more, but you, you know, you, you ever just, the Word of God just, like, really cut you. You ever read it, and it just, oh, you're just like, man, God knows. God, it's just, all these years, all these centuries, all these millennia later, you hear the words and you, man, those were written for me. The piercing to dividing asunder. They were designed. Acts chapter 5, verse number 33. As we look there in the scriptures, we see that as the disciples spoke the word of God. Let's look there, Acts chapter number 5. Now, Acts chapter 5 and verse number 33. Now, um, we're talking about Peter and the apostles. They are literally, in their messages and responses, they are quoting the Word of God. They're putting the Scriptures together with real life, and they're feeding them to the Jews. And Look what happens. Verse number 33. Oh, And when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. We talk about the power of this spiritual sword. You saw, as they said, look, this is the Jesus, the Christ that came. And they quote Old Testament, a prince and a savior giving repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And man, that cut so deep that they were willing, it, it, it invoked a murderous rage in the hearers. And it tells us something about the effects of God's word. Look at Acts 7, 54. Acts chapter 7, famous passage because this is Stephen, right? And his stoning. And it says in 7, 54. Now, I don't know if you ever read his sermon. But just so we're clear, it was so 
Americans would totally not tolerate it if I got up and preached like that. <laughs> it just, he started at the beginning, and Moses did this, and David did that, and it just, I don't want to say it is boring, because it should never be boring for the Christian to hear this, but he certainly wasn't entertaining. All he said was, this is what happened throughout time, and it's all pointed to Jesus, and listen to his words. He says, and um, he says, you stiff-necked, in verse 51, uncircumcised in heart, and in ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they have slain of them which showed before of the coming of the just one of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept it? And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. Now, I would say, now, when Stephen was talking, it might not have sounded like the Word of God to them, but we know now that he was speaking straight from God's heart to their ears, right? Because it's in the Bible. These were the words of God. And as he spoke these words, the Bible said they were cut to the heart. And, they, and, and we go on to things, hear things like they gnashed on him with their teeth. I mean, the vehement anger and, and, and fury that came from that, it's a reminder of this. God's Word is sharp. It is sharp. Now, I, I would say that as far as I've read in the Bible, it seems like men do not react well to the Bible. <laughs> they do not, they, and, and biblically, I mean, they, they do not like to hear the truth from the Word of God. Now, not all men today, I mean, thankfully, as Jesus comes with His grace and mercy, it can cut you to the heart and, and deal a fatal blow to your, to your own person. And then Christ can re, you know, renew and regenerate you through the power of those words as well. It's interesting, this sword that was a blunt or, or, or maybe a warlike weapon in the hands of God becomes a skillful scalpel, right? And it, it changes, it heals the believer, and it cuts out the ailments. I mean, essentially the cancer that is sin is removed by the power of God's word. So it's an amazing thing that God has done, uh, you know, uh, I'm, there's no way that I could use a sword to do surgery, but it seems that Christ, with the power of his word, did such a thing. Someone said it this way, Men do not reject the Bible because it contradicts itself, but because it contradicts them. And the word of God, it cuts. It pierces. Make no mistake, the word of God is a dangerous weapon. And Christians, I think sometimes we fear that reality as we speak to the world about God's power and the power of his words it is difficult sometimes in to show the love of Christ and yet and yet the danger of exposure to the truth of his word and the Christian need not fear as he has the Lord I thought of it this way also that this sword of the spirit is the same sword that God uses we've seen it just a moment ago it says in Revelation 2.16, Repent, or else I will come quickly unto thee, and I will fight against them. With what? With the sword of my mouth. So again, Jesus' weapon of choice on earth and in heaven, in his glorified body, as well as in his human body. His weapon of choice is the word of God. I could take you to Matthew chapter number 5. I could show you the skillful wielding of the word of God. I don't know if we'll have time to do that. We may shortly turn there revelation 19 15 you could turn to revelation chapter 19 if you like it's interesting to me actually how often jesus is described and depicted throughout revelations we've already seen him depicted revelations 1 revelation chapter 2 twice we've had him described and now here he is again in revelations 19 15 notice throughout the course of judgment this words to the churches of that day is words to the ungodly and the judgment of sinners in the end, uh, in his second coming. All of these realities, Christ remains the same. Always coming with the same weapon, the word of his mouth. He says, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations and shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. That's no joke there. But he's using this sword throughout Revelations, both in regards to the church as well as in regards to his ultimate judgment. And it says, 1921, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat on a horse. 
which sword proceeded out of his mouth. So God, again, judgment. And God, this is an all-around weapon for God. God used it to discern the thoughts and intents to pierce, to divide us under the soul of spirit, to, to attack the devil, to attack, I would say, to speak and to launch offensive toward unbelief. And also, he does it toward the church in warning and in revelation in the judgment of unbelievers in the last time. So, we've talked about the sword of the Spirit. We're supposed to take it unto us. But the sword is unique in that it is one of the weapons that doesn't just remain on me, but I actually use it. So let's take a moment, shall we, and see how Christ used the sword. And uh, I, I'll, we'll, we'll do some rudimentary rules for engagement here and uses of the Word of God. Shall we go to Matthew chapter number 5? Matthew chapter number 5. This is a very common passage. You all read it a, a, a dozen times at least. Oh, excuse me, I said Matthew 5, I meant Matthew 4. Matthew chapter number 4. I, I love to always, as we read in the Scriptures, the certainty that we can speak with when we use God's Word. Uh, there's no hesitation in the use um, throughout the Scripture. We see that in Jesus' life here. Let's look at Matthew 4, one. Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness. Is the Word of God what? It's the sword of the Spirit. So Jesus Christ, He put on His armor when He went to fight the devil. And He acknowledged that the Word of God needed to have, he had a spiritual sense, an actual uh, spiritual interpretation. And when He had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, He was afterward and hungered. It's a good thing the Word of God is powerful since His body was just about shot, Right? It's a good thing that when he had no strength in his body, that the Word of God still was powerful. I want to say that too. That you got to love that Jesus wasn't just tempted, but he was tempted at the end of humanity. He had, his body had gone to the furthest reaches that it could. And, I, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what you've read about fasting, but I'm pretty sure 40 days is getting to the limit of how long you can go without food before you're never going to be the same. So Jesus said the the farthest reaches of his human capability. But we're, aren't you glad that the word of God is what? Quick. It's alive. And so that sword was every bit as sharp, even though his body may have been dulled by fasting. Possibly his mind was even stronger because of that fasting, and we certainly know that there's a lot of ways to look at this. Look what he says. And then the tempter came to him, and he said what? What did the tempter say? If What? If thou be the Son of God. Did you love that? The devil only has questions, never answers, right? <laughs> He's always questioning, questioning, questioning. Beware of that kind of a faith that only questions. Questions are good if they have an end, an answer, and, and we get definitive uh, truth from those questions. He said, if thou be the Son of God. What did the Word say? It said He's the Son of God. So we see this as an attack on the Word. I would say... Another acknowledgement here is that the Word of God is not just an offensive weapon, is it? It's also a defensive weapon. I don't know. I haven't been in a lot of sword fights, but I'm pretty sure if you have a sword and a shield and somebody's swinging an axe or a sword at you, there's a good chance you will use that sword to block a few attacks. So it's not just an offensive weapon, even though it has offensive capabilities. He says, if thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. And therein lies the challenge, right? He's perverted the Word of God. Satan is wielding a word, isn't he? He's got a weapon, but it's not the word that we have. He's, he's using, this is fleshly words, this is demon, demonic truth, right? That's how he attacks. But what did Jesus say? But he answered and said what? It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word. It sounded like he willed his sword. The sword of the Spirit is the what? The Word of God. Jesus went up in the Spirit into the wilderness, and what did he use? He used the Word. He used the Word. The devil questioned the Word, which says to me that his direct attack was on the Word of God. 
was on what God had said. It was a misuse of God's word. That's the acknowledgement here. Almost, almost everything the devil says here is in the Bible. Almost everything he says is in the Bible. But it's all misuse. And that's a reminder to Christians, we can't just quote the Bible for our own ends. That's what the devil does. Believers, we have to be in the Spirit. We have to take into us the sword of the Spirit. It is alive. I don't get to say what I wanted to say. It has a mind of its own. He said every word that proceeds out of what? The mouth of God. And, there's, and how many of you think that in Revelations chapter 19, verse number 25, when he says that out of his mouth went a sword, that they were not thinking about Matthew, about how out of the mouth of God comes a sword. See, I, I, I think it's really important to acknowledge these things, that that was, might even be a statement in itself of the deity of Jesus Christ, but we could, that's for another time possibly. Um, then the devil takes them up into a holy city, and he sets them in a pinnacle of the temple. You know what I love about this passage? Do you notice, he's going to take Jesus into all different situations as well as different locations. Interestingly enough here, he is now, before he was in the wilderness, that's, about, that's the farthest, right, from the holy place. But now he is right next to God. I, I like that too because it reminds me of this. The devil is now attacking him. Part of the devil's scheme is to put him closer to a spiritual place when he tempts him the next time. And why do you think he would do that? Why do you think the devil decided for the next temptation, the next attack on God's word to be at the temple? Because people feel safe when they feel spiritual. People feel safe when they feel, spir feel spiritual. And I, I think a lot of your temptations will not only come when you're far away from God, they'll come when you're close to God. The devil will take any chance. He'll change locations. He'll change situations. He'll, he'll get you at all different points of your life. And even now, isn't it amazing that the devil is transporting Christ? The devil is transporting Christ. He is taking Christ places. Talk about the power of the devil, right? Thankfully, he had the weapons that were necessary, though, the quick and alive sword of the Spirit. He says, if thou be the Son of God, there's the if again, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus said unto him, it is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You know, how many of you think that when the devil was using scriptural reasoning, Jesus might have been tempted to use human reasoning? Well, the Bible's, the devil's obviously got a warped view of the Bible. Maybe I should go and try to use some logic here, some angel logic. No. He's going back to the Word of God. Back to the Word of God. And again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain. This is round three. It's two to zero, Jesus winning because of the sword of the Spirit. Not because of his physical strength, right? Not because of his physical strength, but because of his spiritual weapon, his spiritual sword. And it shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he says, all these things will I give to thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, Unto him, get thee hence, Satan. And those are the, <laughs> those are the only words that aren't, that aren't really a quote from the Scripture, right? Get thee hence, Satan. For thou shalt, oh, excuse me, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. And I, I was looking at that temptation. I said, Jesus used the sword. So this sword, it's a spiritual sword. This sword is the Word of God. It has two edges. It's alive. It's powerful. It's effectual and efficient not only in this world against man, but it's universally powerful against Satan. Don't you love that? I'm just really glad that God just gave me one weapon. That makes my life simple, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't have to, I don't have like a bunch of different weapons. They're just All I need is the word of God to fight with man and the devil. 
It works in this world and the next. Jesus used it. God used it. They used it in judgment. They used it for Christians. They used it for non-Christians. He used it for encouragement. It's just, it, it's an amazing thing that God gave us, gave us the word of God. And again, the sole offensive weapon, if you ever feel the need to do any more than defend yourself, to do any more than resist, you only have one option. What is it? The Word of God. And that's important for Christians to remember. All, everything we have is defensive. It's all frontal. We're supposed to stand and face the enemy. And every weapon is defensive except the one. If you ever feel the need to attack, you better use the Word. And I think that's really important for Christians. You better use the Word if you want to be effective, especially against Satan. Let's close with something. I don't know who the writer is, but he wrote it. It's beautiful, and, we'll, and, and I'll read it, and then we'll be done. This book is the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy. Its precepts are binding. Its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be safe. Practice it to be holy. It contains the light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, and the soldier's sword. And the Christian's character. Christ is his grand subject. Our good is designed. And the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. The Word of God, it's amazing. And this is what we stand on, and it's a central peace in God's holy armor. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 6 as we close our little mini-series here on the rules for engagement and move on to finish Ephesians. I'd like to read it once more. Verse number 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, or withstand, if you will, in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that we can come together tonight. We thank you for the power of your Word. Help us, Lord, not to be enamored by the world's logic and statistics and social goods. So enamored that we forget that the Bible is still the central theme. It is the central weapon. It is the Christian's sole offensive tool to wield in the world. And I just, Lord, I just want to pray that we would go, we would go back to the Bible and everything, that we would be our authority. And I pray, Lord, that there would be a renewal in our church and in our hearts to memorize the Scripture, to use the Scripture Lord, help us to have a verse for every difficulty, a verse for every situation, a, to memorize a passage for every need that we have in our lives. Lord, give us the grace to just know the Bible and to use the Bible and to do that not with our own ends and our own desires in mind, but with your intentions and by your Spirit. Help us again, Lord, as Christians, to be reminded of the life of the Spirit, of His will and the personhood of that third person of the Trinity. And remind us, Lord, of the need to know the Bible the way that you have said it. 
And Lord, we know that that's a privilege as well. And so we ask that your spirit would guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the Lord bless you all. We had a great day with you. I want to just make some quick announcements. We're looking forward to possibly having a finger food fellowship again. I've been trying to think how we would do that in COVID times. And so um, we're thinking if we had all hot food and all disposable stuff, you know, uh, then we could, we could do it pretty easily uh, without increasing our liability. So I want you to maybe look forward to that, uh, not this month, but next month on the third Sunday. Um, we're going to have, we're going to be looking for, toward a, um, a, a meal together. I really miss that. I miss the fellowship and the enjoyment of that meal. So um, start thinking about what you can prepare and how you can prepare it and preparing for the option um, to start that up again. We're just looking in faith there, hoping that uh, we'll be able to do all that and not have to worry uh, too much. So uh, praise the Lord for that. And um, as we start to, we're going to start uh, really um, putting more and more activities on the calendar again. Um, I wanted to just maybe make a note. If you're interested in a family camping trip, we talked about it. A lot, some of the ladies were saying, man, we really would have liked to go. If you're interested in something like that with the church where we could just enjoy music and devotions every night together and go together, please let us know. Uh, uh, just, just, just say, man, I, would re- I really want that this year. And we could, we could look toward getting something like that in October or we could push it out to next year too. I'm just, just starting to think about that. We haven't done it in a long time. But some, some of the people were asking me about that, and I said, I think we could work it in. Okay, well, I hope you have a great day. Are there any more announcements we have before we close up our time together? Oh, yes. Uh, Brother Herzl is coming. Uh, th- you guys know the Herzls? Remember the Herzls to Vanuatu? Um, so uh, they're, they've been gone for a long time now. We haven't seen them for years. Um, Jim Herzl's been there. They've established a Vanuatu is there, um, I believe, on the Oceania Islands in I think probably, I'm trying to think if there are Fiji's in that island chain. I can't remember exactly, but they're in a real central island for a tribal people, and people come there to to shop to for education, and they've they've done everything from started a school while they were there, and Bible Institute to training young people to go back and start churches in their home islands. That was a really great ministry and a really neat, humble guy. Um, they're going to be here with us. Not next Sunday, but the following Sunday. We're super excited about that, so look forward to it. He'll be preaching on Sunday um, and a variety of other things. But we're looking for a place to house them. So I'm going to talk to Brother Herzl tomorrow. If you're interested in being a host there for the Herzl family, uh, please let us know if you have a room where we comfortably uh, place them and you'd like to maybe or even have them over for a dinner and, of course, the time there to get to know you and hear about their ministry. Uh, please let us know so that we can... Um, start, we're, we're trying to find a place for them. So, uh, Lord bless you guys. I think that's all my announcements. Uh, can you keep uh, Megan's family in prayer? That her, um, her aunt and then Tom's sister-in-law, I guess Tom and Megan's, they have two ladies in their family diagnosed with cancer. Just so that's a challenge, and their family needs help. I know that they're trying to help. Um, the aunt just recently opened a store, and they're traveling a lot. So just pray for their family. Pray that God would work. Um, through their lives, through Tom and Megan to really be a witness and encouragement, and then that he'd strengthen them as well. Um, we got a lot of that going around. All right, Lord bless you. Take care.